Maps. So without taking more time from the presentations, I'm going to turn you over first to uh, Claire Wilkins and then Tom Kingsley Brown, who works with her. Claire. Okay. Hello. Good morning. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for being here so early. Um, first of all, I want to um, say that I'm, my name is Claire, and I'm the director of Pangea Biomedics, which is an ibogaine treatment center in Playa de Tijuana. Mexico, and um, I'm going to talk about the evolution of an ibogaine treatment today, um, and what that is is not saying that our treatment is any better than any other treatment, it's just how our treatment evolved uh, once um, I took over and started um, working with the clinic. Next. Um, I was treated in 2005. Uh, I'm a former IV heroin user and methadone patient. When I finally came to do Ibogaine, I had been on methadone for almost nine years. And uh, I was treated by Martin Palenko, who owned the Ibogaine Association at the time, who also treated Randy Hankin, who is now the communications director here at MAPS, and many other people who went on to carry the message of Ibogaine by treating other addicts themselves. That seems to be the spirit of this medicine, uh, that people get treated and then immediately <laughs> want to start helping other people. Um, it's, it, this is not an, an ordinary type of medicine where there's a university and a degree. Um, you learn as you go. Uh, next. Okay, what, what, where I came, when I came on the scene in 2005 when I did my uh, treatment, it was basically that the general um, treatments were a three to five day dependency interruption. You came in, usually in a state of withdrawal. I came in, I was two days off methadone. You administered Ibogaine and um, uh, hopefully come, come out of the other side with you know, some, just a few residual withdrawal symptoms, maybe given some boosters, and then you go home. That's what occurred for me and for a lot of people. Um, the, the set and setting, um, there were um, the, the, let me see here, let me just look at this, sorry, sorry for a second, I'm still quite nervous, please bear with me. <laughs> Okay, um, the set and setting, where, where, where I was treated, um, um, there, um, it's, it, as you know with entheogens, it's extremely important what's, how you feel when you're going into taking the medicine and where you are when you take the medicine. Of course, with Ibogaine, you're dealing with chemically dependent people who are coming in scared shitless. They are giving up drugs which have, that have been your best friends for many years, and uh, they're in withdrawal, uh, you know, the feeling like you want to die, there's the, 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 the set. Um, for uh, ibogaine uh, patients is very different from, let's say, of uh, an LSD patient. It's, there's, it's much more critical in terms of uh, health and phys physical health and mental health. You're dealing with many people who are in uh, states of crisis. Um, so for me, when I came in, uh, that was very important, you know, um, figuring out, you know, how to make that better. Um, there was no aftercare model. I didn't uh, discover that there, that there was one in existence at the time. Bruno Rasmussen Chavez, who was treated by Howard Lotsoff, uh, has a center in Brazil that he's had for mm, almost 15 years now where he treats people and he has an aftercare model. Um, Cancun, the clinic where Deborah Mash, who is the premier um, doctor who has worked with Ibogaine and has treated the most patients, um, and has tra she trained the doctors in Cancun, and that was another three to five days that, that, that situation. Um, when I took Ibogaine, the, the, the staff members who were around me had not taken Ibogaine, nor were former heroin addicts or any kind of chemically dependent users um, in any sense, and that was immediately apparent to me that that was something that would be necessary uh, in going through this treatment, is you not only had someone who could understand the fragile state that you were in, but what they did, be, that they could share what they went through um, to get through that side. And also, uh, aside from that, in taking Ibogaine, it's a very, very, very unique drug. Um, 
you, it, it's, it, you opens yourself up to look at yourself very, very deeply. It's a root medicine. You go deep. And a lot of stuff comes up. Especially when you're dealing with addicts, you know, we are people who have a lot of trauma, a lot of violence in our lives, um, uh, and, uh, uh, you know, having someone who can understand that stuff and help you integrate that it was critical. For, for me, what I did um, was I, I figured out my own stuff, and I figured out for myself after I did my treatment, I got my own therapists and uh, people to work with, but I knew that that was a very important point. Um, at the time, Deborah Mash was working on, uh, had been doing research at the University of Miami, but there was no data that would pu was published. Um, and the MAP study had been beginning with the Ibogaine Association, but was uh, 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 halted at that moment. And so that was really important to me, too, getting that back going. Uh, next. Um, the Ibogaine providers on the scene when I came on were Eric Taub who uh, worked uh, offshore and also trained a lot of underground, underground providers. He's been around for about 17 years now. Rocky Caravelli was also treated by Martin Polanco um, at the Ibogaine Association. He went immediately to work with Martin Polanco in Tijuana and then went on to do several years as an underground provider. He became immediately a close confidant of mine and shared with me a lot of his experiences. Um, and right here I really want to um, uh, uh, underscore the importance of the underground movement um, and uh, that being a part of my university, my training. Um, Dimitri Mobengo Mujianis, another Ibogaine provider whom many of you are aware of, who's a vocal and active about his work and, and you know, does not have a fake name at all. <laughs> this man has gone now to the bone and been initiated uh, with Gwiti and has brought Gwiti to um, uh, the United States in a way that's um, just really, really gorgeous and being supported by the universe. Nothing is stopping him. Sandra Carpetas at the time was at the Aboga Therapy House. Marco Riva, it's Riza, that's misspelled, but anyway, it's, uh, he started the Sacrament of Transition, which is a, um, a religious group in Slovenia that um, uh, uses Ibogaine as a sacrament. And through a lot of work on his part, that 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 that, that was established. Uh, Sarah Glatt, who was uh, given ibogaine by Eric Taub, she was treated in. Um, uh, she she was she started her treatments in Holland and has been doing them for many many years. Is a wonderful, amazing uh, provider um, who works without medical equipment and um, tr treats people in, all, from young 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 children to old men and has been a, a big inspiration of mine for a, a woman uh, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a boys, in a boys world. <laughs> Dr. Albert Alberto Sola was at the Cancun Clinic. He was trained by Deborah Mash and Bruno Rasmussen Chavez. He was treated by Howard Lotsoff in Panama. It's a really interesting story. He was an MD who was addicted to morphine and uh, ended up uh, going on to establish his own clinic in Brazil. Uh, which now um, is, is, is uh, a, a fantastic place where he does beautiful pre-care for cocaine addicts and has an excellent success rate there. Next. Um, so when I started, I, I, I came on, I, okay, I, 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 was, I was in no way trained. I didn't have any training in chemical dependency and addiction. I dropped out of uh, college in my, in my final year because of my heroin addiction. Um, so when I came on the scene, um, basically what happened when I bought the clinic was uh, you know, people said, are you crazy? This is crazy. Uh, what, what are you doing? And I said, well, you know, all I know is the treatment that I got and that I want to, to help make treatments better for, for, for people like me. And, and that not that I got a bad treatment at all, I just want to make that clear, but it was a treatment where I felt, where I saw and it was illuminated to me what, how much more could be there for people who were coming to Mexico. With Ibogaine, you can't normally, unless you're, if you're not getting an underground treatment, you can't normally get Ibogaine treatment. You have to travel to Mexico, which... Right now is a war-torn country um, to go ingest an African root. It's, it's, it's a frightening thing for many people, and I really wanted to create the most loving, safe, compassionate space for people to experience Ibogaine. So I started calling people. I started calling, and, and, and some people laughed at me. Some people called me crazy. A lot of people ignored me. Um, and uh, But Howard, Howard uh, Lotsoff was there for me. He was kind of you know cranky at first. He said, watch for the QT intervals. That was his main uh, instruction, which is really important. Uh, Ibogaine can prolong the QT interval, which is a measure, a measure on an EKG um, that deals with conduction. And, and if your QT interval is prolonged, um, you can develop an arrhythmia and complications occur. And So right away, he was teaching me. 
right away. And um, Rocky, I developed a relationship, and Ken Alpert, we'll be speaking with later, became a very close confidant of mine. He's someone who has published a, an article in the Journal of Ethnopharmacology on the medical subculture and studied the whole scene for the past 15 years. Um, and I started going to conferences. In the, the first uh, one in Poland was where I met in Warsaw. I met uh, a lot of other providers from France and from Israel. Next. Um, and I, I started building my own treatment. I was, I was at the same, this is what happens with Ibogaine a lot is people get treated and then they start treating. They don't necessarily get better and then start treating. Okay, so at the same time that I was doing this, um, I was developing relationships with my, I had a meditation teacher, I was doing meditation intensives and learning how uh, to be in my body, which is the ultimate challenge for people coming off drugs, how to be in your body. Um, and uh, so that was a very important for me. I, Neil Vincent, what, that's a picture of him right there, he's our chronic pain specialist. I call him my human Swiss army knife. Um, he uh, was volunteering at the clinic when I got my treatment uh, with him at Martin's clinic and uh, is another madman attracted to this medicine and um, you know uh, really um, has worked closely with me now for five years and devoted his time and um, to come up with a new way of, of treating people and the chronic pain that underlies them, whether they have actual physical pain, which over 50% of our clients do, and the emotional pain and how to work with that. Um, I started seeing a therapist uh, who helped me and introduced me to, with uh, my nutrition, my amino acids, uh, a therapy, amino acid therapy, he introduced me to that. Ken Alper, um, I mentioned Rocky Calabria, and then Iboga. I, I was developing a really wonderful um, tutelage, uh, of receiving tutelage from this, this plant. And um, that was something new for me. I was not ever really into entheogens or plant wisdom. This was something that came through me through that experience and was, uh, I was, it was given to me in, in a state of grace. And I, I did not ignore that at all. Uh, next, please. Uh, that's the old clinic. That's me uh, when uh, in, in place, uh, in front of the, the old clinic uh, where I was treated. That's actually a duplex on the right side. There is where we were treated, and this is when we go back to set and setting. Um, again, not that this was a bad place. There's hotel rooms where people are treated with Ibogaine. There's no judgment in any of that. But for me, I knew that I really wanted a place with more space, more light. I wanted trees. I wanted grass. I know this was a lot in Tijuana to ask for. But um, next slide. Um, we, we did end up getting that. We ended up getting, um, a, a, in, within six months, we ended up renting a new place, which is within, oh, somewhere on this picture, in this slide, we'll see the picture of the new place. But um, the, the need for integration came up. How do you integrate an Ibogaine process? What comes up? Um, I touched on this a bit. Um, this is part of a, um, my whole uh, process as well. Um, sexual trauma comes up, unprocessed memories, unmourned grief, um, relationship dynamics. You don't just treat someone with Ibogaine, get them off drugs, and then they're cool, okay? A whole bunch of deep, deep issues emerge, and being able to handle that is quite the challenge. I think it's probably the biggest challenge of my job, and I love it the most. And um, I worked with Neil. He had done a lot of work in traditional rehabs where people were there for a long time and they had groups and they dealt with um, issues from the disease model, from the 12-step model. And we knew that that was not working uh, for people. A lot of people came in completely disenchanted. I knew I was. Um, so what is therapy? How do, you, how do you treat people who've tried everything? <laughs> you know, what, what kind of new therapies do you bring in? And it seemed like a whole new therapy um, was starting to emerge, and it's an, or an organic therapy. We like our therapy at the clinic organic, like we like our food, how it comes up there in the moment with the client. Um, the paramedic can be the therapist with you, um, and we all we have this 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 group this 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 group consciousness that we form together, where we are always exchanging information from the the, the woman who the cleaning lady who's even taken ibogaine herself to the doctor to the paramedic to the therapist to the chronic pain specialist to the volunteer. We're always sharing information, and you never know who the client is going to bond with at that moment. 
or during that time. Many times people are very, very mistrustful and it's, there's only one person, you know, that they feel like they can share with. So it's important to utilize that and go, okay, dude, you're the therapist this week. Okay? 